Good evening. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we just want to thank you for the day of the Lord where we can gather in the house of the Lord to praise you, to worship you, because all praise is due unto you. We thank you this evening, Father, for the time of worship that was led by the worship team. We thank you that they carried us to the courts of heaven. We thank you for the time of intercession that was, Lord, that broke through and, Lord, created a pathway for this evening, Lord. Father, this evening I pray that you will speak to us through your word. And may your word, Lord, be an encouragement to us. May it be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Father, I pray and submit to you the word that you have laid upon my heart. Let it be used, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. I must... So today is Palm Sunday. And Palm Sunday was the day that Jesus last came into Jerusalem before he was crucified. And I had a moment with the Lord when the worship team was worshipping this evening. And I had not cried like that at worship for a while. The moment they started singing, there's a hill, there's a hill on, the, there's a hill called Mount Calvary. I suddenly saw the back opening out. And there was this like a roadway and a pathway and it was full of light. And I saw a, like a silly house, that, that was not a person, but I believe it was the Lord Jesus walking across and coming into our presence. So I think there was something that moved when that song was sung this evening, where that opened out a pathway. And I am not surprised because I believe that as we have been looking at prayer as a theme during this month, that prayer is that what makes the pathway for God to walk into our lives. And I believe that each one of us will have that experience that even as we go in deep into that prayer that we have been spoken and taught about that God will make a pathway and come into our lives and we can experience God in a better way. So we know as we'll be looking at, 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 at prayer, we heard the previous week about different kinds of prayer in the community. We heard about prayer of identity, prayer of agreement, prayer of desire. And also that we were reminded that we are chosen and when we cry out to, day, cry to God day and night, God executes justice to us and he does it very swiftly to us. And so that we may receive his glory, share his glory and we be kept in his glory is what we have been encouraged. The week before that we were taught about the Lord's prayer which we all know and this is something that we need to practice every day. Today my topic is on persistent prayer. Now this is something that was, something was challenging to me a long time in my life. So let's go with me first to Matthew 6 verses 7 and 8. It's there, okay. Shall we read this together? And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases at the Gentiles. Do for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Jesus said this just before he taught the disciples the Lord of Prayer. If you look at it in scripture, this was said just before he introduced the Lord's Prayer. So if I want something in prayer, and God my Father who clearly loves me and is ready to answer my request, why then do I have to ask and pray more than once? Now, this is something that I always sometimes struggle with. I say, Lord, you know my needs. And you say that you will give my needs. So why is it that I need to persistently keep asking you? And I don't know how you have felt, but I have felt like that. Have you felt like that at any point in life? Yes, I can see some nodding their heads that they have felt. So I'm not alone in that. So... We live today in a world of instant. We start with instant noodles to instant food to instant messages. When we send a WhatsApp, we expect that person to reply immediately. If he doesn't, we get very upset. We don't know whether the person has looked at it or not. But we have got used to this instant gratification. And so we also think every time that we cry unto the Lord, that the Lord will speak to us instantly and give an answer to us instantly. Let's go with me to Colossians 4.2. 
Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So Paul is telling us something very important here is the Paul is telling us continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. So this word with thanksgiving becomes very important, beloved, because sometimes we allow and we major on the negative without majoring on the positive. When we major on the positive, we always give thanks to God. We thank God before we even get the answer because we know God will give us the answer. So this is very important for us to grasp and for us to get hold of. Be persistent in prayer. Keep alert as you pray, always giving thanks to God. So why have we got to ask God over and over again? Why? Do we have to... Do we have to cajole God? Do we have to bombard him? Do I have to wear down God? Do I have to beg or bribe or plead or cry and bother him? So God will say, okay, 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 I will answer. That's how with men we do, no? We keep bothering them until they answer. If a child keeps bothering a parent, the parent at some point says, okay, okay, I will do it for you because I want to get rid of the issue. So do we have to do that with God? Is that the God we serve? Absolutely not. That's not the God we serve. The reason God wants us to ask and pray multiple times is not for God's benefit. It is actually for our benefit. It is actually for my benefit. And for Jesus, persistent prayer was very important. Why do I say persistent prayer was very important for Jesus? Because it was so important for Jesus Jesus did not speak about it once. Jesus speaks about it twice in two parables. So it has to be important for him to say it twice. And we are going to look at the parables this evening. And these two parables are parables of contrast. So what do we mean by a parable of contrast? In contrast means God listens and cares even if people don't do. And the point is God is eager to answer our prayer. Because a parable is a story with a point, with a lesson, with an insight, which God wants you and me to get. Bible says Jesus always taught in parable. So the first parable we are going to look at is of the parable of the persistent friend, which is in Luke 11, verses 5 to 10. But I'm not going to read the whole passage of scripture of that story. But in a summary, you know that a friend came to visit a friend at midnight. And he did not have anything at home. So he went to his friend next door and he tapped on it and said, can you give me three loaves of bread because a friend has come and I have nothing to set upon the table. And that friend says, look, it is fast midnight. I have showered. I have gone to bed. My children are in bed with me and do not trouble me. So let's pick up that scripture from verse 8 as we go and let's read it from verse 8. From verse 8 it says, I say to you, though he will not rise and give it to him, because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. Because of his persistence. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. So here we have been introduced to what is persistence is keep asking, keep seeking, and keep knocking. And the second parable we are going to look at today is of the persistent widow, which is taken from Luke 18, verses 1 to 8. Can we read this together? Can you all see it? So let's read together. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So this is, there's an emphasis on that, that they always ought to pray and not lose heart, which means we can lose heart when we are praying and waiting for something. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. I don't hear anybody else reading it. Oh, sorry. It's my fault, not everybody else's fault. Let's read together. And he told them a parable to the effect 
that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. He said in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterwards he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? So who is God's elect? Who is God's elect? Can the God's elect put their hands up? We are God's elect. We are chosen. So there is a promise that when we ask the Lord, the Lord will reply us speedily. But also Jesus says, Will there be faith when the Son of Man comes? Because if you and I get answers speedily, our faith will be intact. But for Jesus to say, will there be faith when the Son of Man comes, there is a possibility of us losing faith because we are still waiting for an answer. Am I right? So that is what Jesus is telling us. So speedily means it's in God's time. Until then, we need to pray in faith. And that's why we say he makes all things beautiful in his time. All things beautiful in his time, not my time. And James gives a preview to why sometimes answer does not come to us speedily. Let's look at James 4. Oh, sorry. Now I'm going all over. This is what happens when you try to do something. No. Sorry, that scripture is not there. James 4 2 says, You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So this is a scripture that is important for us to understand because this is, I have taken it from the ESV, which is from 2B and 3. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So we must ask to receive on the other hand. It also says you don't receive because you ask wrongly. So if we, are, if we ask wrongly, we need to know, am I asking God what I'm asking for rightly? Or how do I ask God what I need to ask from God rightly? If Jesus tells us two stories to understand one truth, it must be very important, isn't it? Otherwise, why should Jesus tell two stories to just underline one truth? In my 26 years of walking with the Lord, my first six, 19 years, God answered every prayer very swiftly. Uh, before even I, thought, even I thought in my mind, God has provided and God has answered and God has blessed. But the last seven years, God has been taking me through a journey where I had to dig in, where I had to persist, where I had to keep pushing in prayer, asking God, God, what are you telling me in this season? And where are you taking me? And God started revealing himself to me in a complete different manner. So this is the experience that I want to share with you this evening in this message of what God has been teaching me and taking me through about persistent prayer because I had always got answers for prayer instantly. And when that season came where God wanted to change, God was teaching me something. So what is the first, there are two principles he taught me and I will first share those two principles and the first one is to keep my attention focused on God. The first one is to keep my attention focused on God. Let me ask you this question. What is the greatest gift you can give a loved one? What is the greatest gift? 
I hear love. Anything else? What is the greatest gift? Some of you are barred in saying this answer because I have told you all this. Sorry, did I hear something, Nimesh? Time. Love time. Let me suggest to you, the greatest gift that we can give anyone is attention. Why am I saying? Because attention is your time. Time is your life, which you cannot get back. And giving one someone's attention Giving one someone's attention is very, very important. And that is why it is the highest gift you can give anyone. The greatest role model who focused his attention on God, and we saw how God worked in his life, is David. Because David, all the time, had his attention fully on God, and because of that, he had a relationship with God, which he worked out with him in many ways to take him to where God wanted to take him to. Psalm 25, verse 15, which says, My eyes are continually looking to the Lord for help, for he alone can rescue me from all the trap. And in some translations it says, for he alone can pluck my feet out of the net. Now this is very important because what David is telling and showing us is, in this psalm is, when you continually look at the Lord, the Lord is going to show you if there is a trap in front of you. The Lord is going to show you is there a net that is waiting to catch you. Because you and I do not know what is there tomorrow. You and I do not know what is there one week ahead. But God knows. So it is like we are driving on a, on a road and there is this big vehicle that has stalled in front and you don't know whether to overtake or not because you can't see the other side. And then you suddenly get a helicopter that comes over and where you can radio and ask, can I move forward? Is it safe for me to overtake? And the helicopter says, yes, you can overtake. It is, that's the relationship. When you, when you keep continually looking is, keeping your attention focused on God, God is going to show you any pitfalls that you can stumble from and the Lord will encourage you to take a different roadway and a different way to overcome that and go forward. God sees the traps and nets that are before us and if we keep looking to the Lord, he will always rescue us, beloved. Psalm 104, 24, David says this again. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face constantly. Seek his face constantly. Because there are moments when we are finding difficulty, when we are going through difficult circumstances, we will feel weak. But we know what the, word, what the, what the Lord promises. In my weakness, his strength is perfected. So when we keep looking at the face of God, we begin to get the strength from God so that we can overcome our weaknesses. Don't worry when you're weak. Seek God in my weakness and his strength is perfected. When we keep our attention focused on God, we begin to know God as El Shaddai, the all-sufficient one. Because the all-sufficient one protects us, directs us, and provides for us. Because all three things the Lord will do. He will protect us from the snare. He will protect us from the trap. He will direct us in the path that we need to take. And he will provide for us in every stage of our life, whatever that we need to have. The second thing that I learned is having to wait teaches me about myself. Because when you have to wait for God and when you have been praying persistently waiting for some answer, it starts teaching you about yourself, about myself. You're going to learn something when you're praying and waiting for an answer that you will not learn in any other way, beloved. I not only learn about God, I learn about me. Because when you're working in prayer, God is working in you. That's what happens. Because it's a two-way street. He works in me when I work in prayer. Zechariah 13, 9a, I have taken this from today's English version in order to bring, highlight it to you. I will test, sorry. I will test and purify them as silver is purified by fire. I will test them as gold is tested. Then we will pray to me, then they will pray to me, and I will answer them. This is a beautiful scripture, which tells us silver is purified by fire. 
Because there is a separation that happens when silver goes through fire. And I will see them as gold is tested. How does the goldsmith test gold? How does the goldsmith know now is the time to take it out? Anyone can remember? He takes it out when he starts seeing his face in the gold. That's the time he takes it out. So until God seeks his face, God keeps purifying us in a process because we are taken from glory to glory, from faith to faith. So let me give you four areas in life that God purifies and tests through persistent prayer. And this is my experience. I'm sure there might be some more, but these four areas covers a lot. The, the first is God tests my desires. What do I really want? Because we all have desires, beloved. The reason we have desires is because God has put it in our hearts. But desires can be misused, abused, and perverted. Just take a simple example. If you take a fire, a fire in a fireplace is, is conducive and good. But if it's in the wrong place of the house, the house will burn down. Take water as an example. If you take water as an example, water is good, but too much of it can cause a flood and drown you and destroy you. Any of God's gifts can be misused and abused and perverted by Satan, beloved. God instituted marriage and God gave a good gift called sex that was for marriage. But what did Satan do? He perverted it and he has forced man to take it out of the boundaries of God so it becomes sinful and it becomes dirty. So Satan takes what God gave for good and tries to mislead and pervert it so that people will fall trapped in that. So there are good desires in our life and there are not so good desires in our life. Desires that are appropriate, desires that are inappropriate. Desires that are helpful, desires that are harmful. Desires that are righteous, desires that are unrighteous. Desires that are constructive, and desires that could be destructive. When we pray persistently, our desires begin to filter and be purified, and then we know that this is something good for me to hold on, this is something not good, so I need to let it go. So that's what happens when we keep prayer, praying to God persistently. God starts examining me. Is my desire in line for what God has for me? Now, everything won't be a bad thing, but God for every season has a purpose in our life. So does it fit my purpose? Or has it got to be some other time? And that's the understanding that the Lord starts giving when we persist in prayer. Our deepest desires come from God and it is part of our God-given shape. Because we all have a shape. My shape is different to what Jehan may have or what Dinesh may have. So we all have a shape and we have to understand God gives us things to fit our shape and to work with our shape. And that's what God does to in our life. So God puts that desire in your heart and God wants you to ask for that desire. That deep desire when it's purified in it, you can keep asking the Lord. Because when you keep asking the Lord, it builds a relationship. It builds a connection. And that's what we see in David's life. He had a relationship. He had a connection with God. He knew at every moment he can go to God. Even in the most difficult moment, he knew how to strengthen himself in God. Because he knew God. He had that relationship and he had that connection. So when you have a need, recognize the need and then verbalize it to God. But our first desire should be God and everything else must come second, beloved. Look at this scripture in Psalm 37, 4. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. How many of you have a desire in your heart that you want God to give you? So the answer is there. Take delight. What do you mean by taking delight in the Lord? Paying attention to God. Taking delight is paying attention that I give all my attention to him and then he will bring that, to, that desire to pass in our life. The second thing is persistent prayer tests my priorities. What is most important in life to me? Because we all have priorities in life. 
When we pray about something, it's clarified what is important to us. Now, how, if I ask you what, I, what is most important to you right now, will you answer me? Now, I'm not telling you to answer. How do you know what is important to you right now in your life? You know what is important to you, what, you, what is right now in your life? The very thing that you worry about. You're worrying about it because it's important to you. That's why you're worrying about it, because it is important to you. Worry tells you what's most important in your life. So what's worrying you today? Beloved, it's worth, if it's worth worrying about it, then it is worth praying about it. Because if it's worth to take your time to worry about it, then it's worth to take your time to pray about it. If you pray on everything that you worry, soon you will have nothing to worry. Because if everything will be good, you will have nothing to worry. So it is says, worry all you want and it will change nothing. Pray about it and it will change everything. Pray about it and it will change everything. Every time you begin to worry about something, stop and turn it into a prayer. Turn worry to worship. Turn your attention to God. Shall we for a moment turn our attention to God? If you may join with me. So just a simple thing that I'm going to sing now. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of the earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of his glory and grace. Shall we all sing it together once more? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of the earth will grow strangely dim. In the light of your glory and grace. Has the thing gone off? Matthew 6, 32 and 33. Why be like unbelievers who worry about everything? Your heavenly father already knows all your needs. And he will give you all you need if your first concern is to live for his kingdom. When our priorities are right, God's answer is yes. The question that comes many a time is, and I have heard many people saying this, and those days I also used to think like that until God corrected me. Have you, have you ever heard somebody saying, I am waiting on God for an answer? We have heard people saying, sometimes we also may have said that. But the question is, am I waiting from God for an answer or is God waiting on me for a change? That's the question. Psalm 84 verse 11b. No good thing will the Lord be told from those who do what is right. So there is a promise that God will not withhold anything for anyone who does it right. There is nothing God will give, not give a man or a woman who is totally committed to do what is right. So let me ask the question this evening. Where are your priorities? Or what are your priorities? Is there anything in life that has taken first place which you, knew, which you have to give to God? Today, because of technology, there is a lot of distraction that comes to us. And social media is a good thing, but it also can be the biggest destruction. And you know what I do is every week there is an update that comes that how long I have spent on the screen. And it tells for what I have spent on the screen. So the question that I always keep asking is, am I spending more time on social media than I'm spending on the word of God? It's a reflection. It's a test, litmus test for me to know where my priorities are. Has my priorities gone wrong? Or is my priorities on track the way it should be? 
The third point is, it tests my maturity. Persistent prayer tests my maturity. And this is the big, big chunk. This is the most important place that God brings us to and tests us because he wants to test our maturity before he can give us something more. When God does not give us something immediately, God is testing our maturity. What does it mean by testing our maturity? He's testing my character. He's testing how responsible am I? Have I grown up or not? Or it's a God check on my life. And that's what God does when it comes to testing your maturity. Today, many want God to be their genie. You know what you buy me by genie is? That you come and say, these are my requests. God, Lord, I want an answer. And that's how genies are. And that's how I was. You have heard my testimony once before. And the little part which is now applicable to this message, I will share. When I first came in on the 21st of January, 1995, I came looking for a genie. I did not come looking for a savior. I came looking for a genie. Because at that time, I have achieved quite a bit in life. I was, at 30 years, I was the director of sales and marketing at Hilton. And there was a quite an achievement. And I said the only thing that I did not have at that time was a house of our own. And so I came looking for a house of my own. I came to a genie looking for a blessing. But God met me as my savior, as my father, as my friend. And what did he first tell me? He first told me, you lose your temper. You explode when you lose your temper. If you give your life to me, I will change your life around. Now, the amazing thing is, God was interested in me and my character more than giving me a blessing in that moment. And that's where it takes you to maturity. Because when I had that plan about that house, I had a beautiful plan, and that plan had a beautiful bar set up where I would want to where I would want to give people and entertain people when they came. That was in my plan. But before that, God did a change. Because on the 19th of March, 2000, uh, 19th of March, 1995, at the Hilton Christmas party, we, we always get two beer coupons of draft beer. And I went and took that draft beer, and I drank that draft beer, and something from inside repulsed every every uh, thing that I wanted to have liquor for. I could not drink it. I put it aside. I came home because I had been traveling a lot at that time, and I poured 29 bottles of different kind of liquor into the sink. It was only God who could do that. Why did God do that? Because God was interested in me. Before God could bless me, God wanted me changed, beloved. Before God could use me, God had to do certain alignments inside of me. And that's what God did in my life. Because that's the day I met my Savior. That's the day I met my Father. And when I met my Father, what do fathers want to do for children? You want to make them better, isn't it? Similarly, God wanted to make them better and he didn't stop there. What I came for, I got within three years. 1998, we had a house of our own. God created a way. And by 2003, God paid for it in full also, in a way that I did not expect. But that's our God. That's our God. So what is maturity? If you tell a child, not now, will he get it? No, no, most times children will not get, not now. They will want it then. The child will immediately, what does the child immediately do when you don't give? Throws a tantrum. Now Cynthia will say, yes, they throw a tantrum. Because she has grandchildren, when they ask something and they don't give, they will shout, they will scream, they will roll, they will do all kinds of things because they want it. They want it now. Immature people don't know how to wait. They want it now. Little children don't know the difference between no and not yet. The question is, do we? Do we know the difference between no and not yet? The number one problem many have in life is they cannot wait. They want instant gratification. And the biggest problem and hindrance that is there is the credit card. Because you can have instant gratification without money in your bank. And we have seen people 
falling a prey because of that into great trouble. Beloved, while you're waiting, God is working, putting together something in place before he answers you. So patience is a mark of maturity. Patience is the mark of maturity. And we need to learn patience in our life. And that's what God has been teaching me over these last seven years. Patience, patience, patience. Maturity is that you know the difference between delay and denial. There is a delay and there is a denial. But we need to know the difference and for that we need to be mature. Beloved, be assured that God wants to meet your deepest need, be it physical, spiritual, emotional or relational. God has promised to meet your needs, but God is more interested in your character than your comfort. We are more interested in our comfort. Now in my testimony, I told you, God was more interested in my character before he gave me the comfort. Why? Because character is what takes us to heaven. Comfort is not what takes you and me to heaven. It's the character that takes us to heaven, beloved. God wants to meet all our needs, but more importantly, God wants to see our character becoming like Christ. Christ is, was patient, is patient. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. So how do we learn patience? Sometimes we get stuck in a long queue. How do we react then? Sometimes we get caught in a big snarl of a traffic jam. Is God teaching us patience at that time? We need to ask God. We also learn patience when we pray persistently and when we don't see the result coming immediately. Then we learn patience. God is testing our character, our heart, our maturity through relations. I'll give you a little two life illustrations. Most of you here have had little kids when they were born. What happens when a child is born? When a child is born, whenever the child wants something, the child cries. And what does the mom or the father do? They go running, pick that child up, maybe give some milk, put the child to comfort, or do something so that the child is satisfied. Am I right? But comes the day that you know this child is now crying for everything. So you have to take a decision. And that decision is that you have to let the child cry and cry and cry and then fall asleep without you reacting. Was it easy for a mother or father? No. Was it easy for any one of you to, when you came to that stage? No, I'm sure it was not. But was it important for the development of that child? Yes, it was important for the development of that child. Likewise, when your children come to teenagehood, there is also a moment that comes where you have to keep your kids at home and you have to go out. But you are very scared to do that. Will he be responsible enough? Will he be able to look after? And you keep your child and you go, but every 10 minutes you keep calling because you're not sure. But there comes a moment that child meets that responsibility. Was it easy for you to do? No, I'm sure it was not. But was it important for the development of the child? It was absolutely important for the development of the child. So here's the thing, beloved. When God, when the Lord thinks you are mature enough, he is going to let you go alone. There is going to be a period that comes in your life, and I have experienced that period. You are absolutely alone. You do not even sense God around you. God is there, but I don't sense God around me. You are absolutely alone. And that's the most critical period of test in maturity. Because during that time, I can sulk. During that time, I can say, so Lord, it's unfair. That person whom I trusted so much has not even called me. That person who loves me, says who loves me so much, has not even come to see me. I react, can re react in different, different ways. And believe me, at first, I felt exactly that. Until God one day came and told me, Son, this I have permitted so that you will trust me fully and not anyone else. 
that you will trust me fully. So it is not the people around me. The problem was Lord wanted me to understand a principle. God wanted to for me to understand that there is a moment I have to put my full trust on him. For there comes a moment that I have to let go, my, not be trust on my feelings, but trust, but trust on God. And that's the experience that God tested me. Because being left alone is our character test, beloved. Because in a character test, there are two things that happen in our life. One, how will you, I do without supervision? How will I start taking decisions? Will I ask God and take decisions? Or will I run because man has told me do this and do that and do this? Because temptations come at that very moment. Devil tries to attack you at that very moment. Because you are weak. But when you keep, every time when you keep going to God, and that's one principle me and Rasika always had. Every time we ask, Lord, what are you telling us in this? What are you telling this in my, this particular moment in life? And God has instructed us very clearly. There was no doubt about it what the Lord wanted and where the Lord was leading us. Will you keep praying when the answer is not instant? When the answer is not quick? quick? Will you throw in a temper trump, tantrum and say, God, you are not fair? That's the test that we go through in that time of isolation where God keeps testing us. That's the, that's the fire. That's, that's the most hottest moment of the fire. Because God wants to check our heart and check if we are ready to handle the blessing. It's simple as that. God is wanting to see, am I ready for God to give what God wants to give me? Same thing with you. God is just checking, not because God is angry with you, not because God is saying you're a sinner, but just that God wants to know, are you ready for God to do what God wants to do in your life? King Hezekiah was a very good king. But see what scripture says about King Hezekiah. 2 Chronicles 32, 31b in the Messenger Bible says this. God left Hezekiah on his own for a while to see what he would do. God wanted to test his heart. God wanted to test his heart. So there will be moments in life God will keep you alone because God wants to test your heart to see what you will do, beloved. When Israel was brought out of Egypt to the promised land, they were tested if they were mature enough, responsible enough, or committed enough to receive the blessing of the promised land. That was the testing of Israel, nothing else. God said, I'm taking you to the promised land, I'm giving you the promised land, but God wanted to check, are they ready to go and accept and do what God wants in that promised land? Same thing is for you and for me. Are we ready to go and do what we are called to do in the promised land that God wants to take us to? The good thing is, when God gives a test, he allows us to repeat it. He doesn't want to fail us. He wants to pass us. So he allows us to repeat it. So that's what persistent prayer does. I may fail the first time. I go to God and say, God, I'm sorry. I have missed what you're saying. What are you telling? Lord, show me the way. Israelites were given 40 years, but unfortunately one generation missed out. But I don't think any of us need to miss out in what God wants to give each one of you because God has a promised land for each one of you, a place that you have not even seen or you have imagined because what God has for you is much more than our thoughts or our imaginations, beloved. Deuteronomy 8.2 says this. The Lord led you through the wilderness for 40 years, humbling and testing you to prove your character and to find out whether or not you would really obey his commands. When God is delaying to answer, God is testing our desire, testing our priorities, testing our maturity. Let's get honest here. Take a simple example. When you get a headache and when you pray, what are you expecting? You're expecting for the pain to go, isn't it? You're expecting for the symptom to go. But what is God interested? God is interested in healing the cause that's causing the headache, which may take a more longer time than the symptom to go. 
So it is important for us to understand that sometimes in our walk with God, that God wants to cut out the root of cancer when we want a quick healing. But there is a root of cancer what God wants to cut off. And that takes working with each one of us much more than what we would like to. The very root that is causing the problem in a relationship, your marriage or in your finances. We want God to clear our debt, but God says, how about working on what causes you to get into debt in the first place? He wants, we want to feel the ease, but God wants to heal the disease. Most times we want to feel the ease, beloved, but God wants to heal the disease. We want God to change the circumstances, but not my character. And that's the struggle that we have sometimes. So here's the thing. When you're praying for God for a breakthrough in your life, the question to ask yourself is, am I willing for God to change me instead of God changing my circumstances? This, beloved, is called the point of surrender. A point of surrender happens in every breakthrough prayer before breakthrough comes. If you are willing to get to the point of allowing God to change you, your attitude, your heart, your character, to grow up and change you more like Christ, then God will not answer your prayer. Because until that happens, God sometimes will withhold something because God doesn't want us to spoil the good thing that God wants to give you. Romans 6.13 says this. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought down from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. What does this mean? It means give yourselves completely to be used in the hands of God, for he is good for his good purposes. And that's the point of surrender. Will you give your life to be used as an instrument by God? That's the point of surrender. That's the point of surrender, beloved. Lord, this is what I want, but more else I want to be in the center of your will. Even Jesus struggled with it. He said, Lord, let this cup pass away, but not my will, but thy no God. Sometimes there is a cup that comes to us. It is very difficult to drink. It is very difficult to endure. But if we say that prayer, what Jesus said, Lord, let this cup pass away, but not my will, but thy know God, we are getting into the center of God's will. And when we get into the center of God's will, we will see the breakthrough coming. The last point is praying persistently. Test my faith. What does it mean testing my faith? As human beings, we live a lot with feelings. So testing my faith is testing, do I trust my feelings or do I trust my father? Whom do I put my trust in? If I trust on my feelings, my feelings will surely go away quickly. It will change, like the weather changes. But if we trust on the father, we know he is unchanging. I know God has said, I know you, I love you, I'm going to meet your need. But it's a mistake to trust our feelings, beloved. We need to know our Father, and we need to know Him intimately. For God made you and knows what is good for you, and what would make you happy. He, who need, he knows your needs more than you do. So can you trust your Father today? Whatever has happened in the past, forget about. But can you put your trust in your Father that He will give you a better future? That he will look after your children far better than even what you could. That's what trusting my father means. This scripture we all know, Jeremiah 29, 11, we love to quote this. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. For plans to unfold, we need to wait on God's timing. Because in a plan, there's always a timing. If you do a plan in your business plan, even there is a timing for everything. Oops. Sorry, I went and pressed the wrong one. There's a planning for everything. There's a time. So if God's plan is to come forth in our life, we need to wait for that season. We need to wait for that time. In fact, the bigger the something God wants to do in your life, the longer the wait is. 
Take a simple example. You all have seen or heard, or some may have even traveled in an A380, Airbus 380. That was the biggest aircraft that came. But can that aircraft take off or land in any runway? Now, Roshan will know, no, it cannot. Because when the bigger the aircraft is, the longer the runway should be and wider the runway should be. So there is a construction that needs to go into your life path before God gives you what he wants to give you. So if there is a delay because you are praying, Lord, you promised this, I'm waiting for this, but God is saying, yes, son, I'm making it, I'm making it, I'm making it. And it doesn't stop there because we know then a pilot car assists the aircraft into that into the sideway runway and then guides it to the main there is a there is a process so there is a process and sometimes we don't want to wait for that process to come through we want quick results beloved but we see in abraham david moses their lives they all had a long wait because there was something significant that the lord wanted to do in their lives so if your waiting is for a long be encouraged God wants to do something significant. Something significant to impact whoever God wants you to impact. Something significant for the kingdom of God and the furtherance of the kingdom of God. Something significant so that people will come to know that God is his provider. God is his healer. God is the one who reigns above him and all what he does. And that's why sometimes there is a delay, beloved. Galatians 6, 9, it's a beautiful scripture which says, let us not get tired of doing what is right, for at the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing, and if we don't get discouraged and give up, there is a harvest of blessing waiting for you, beloved. There is a harvest of blessing God wants to give you and your families. There is a harvest of blessing he wants to bring to your companies, to wherever that you are doing your work in. There is a harvest of blessing because you are the channel of blessing to the place that God has kept you. You are the channel that the Lord will flow through. You are the channel the Lord will give, with, uh, give others what others need to have in this time and in this season. For God, our faith is desirable and precious than anything else that he will give us. So let me summarize this message. Persistent prayer benefits me and not God. It benefits me. It tests my desires. It tests my character. It tests my maturity and builds my faith and strengthens my life. Through the process of persistent prayer, I am purified as silver and tested as gold until the face of God will be seen in me and Christ-like character will be built in me. So I'm coming to a landing by asking you one question. Can the worship team come up even as I come to a close after this? How many of you have unanswered prayer? Does any of you have unanswered prayer? Oh, there is a lot who have unanswered prayer. Put your hands up. Put your hands up. Hands up. A lot has unanswered prayer. But here's the thing. There is nothing called unanswered prayer. God always answers prayer. But we think there is unanswered prayer. Because we have not worked out with the Lord and we have not come to an understanding why the answer has not come to us as yet so here's the thing God always has answer to your prayer so these four points are very important these are my closing points because this once you understand this you will know God always answers prayer the first is when my request is not right God says no When my request is not right, God says, no. When I am not right, God says, grow. Which means I'm not ready to handle the responsibility. When the timing is not right, God says, slow. No, no, it's not too fast for you to slow down a bit. And when, the, when my request, the timing and my character are all lined up right, God says, go. 
So God answers prayer in all these four ways, beloved. It is for us to understand, is it a no, is it a grow, is it a slow, before God could tell us it's a go. Always remember that the meaning of the word good is not the same way I think to God. You may ask, what, I, what am I saying? Good is good, no? Yeah. Good is good. Good for us is a positive outcome, isn't it? You all agree? But what is good to God? Good to God is anything that serves His purpose. What serves the purpose of God is good in the sight of God. It may be not good for me at that moment, but it is good in the purpose that God has for me and God has for you. Let me close with this last scripture. Ephesians 6, 18 says, Pray at all times and on every occasion in the power of the Holy Spirit. Always stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all Christians everywhere. There are some important things that say pray at all times. All times. Ceasingly, day and night, we are called to pray. And on every occasion, whatever that occasion, go to prayer with God. Ask God, God, what are you telling me in this time? What are you showing me? What are you asking me? And ask in the power of the Holy Spirit. Always stay alert. Staying alert means you're waiting. What God showing me? Where is God asking me to go? Is he asking me to turn? Is he asking me to stop? Is he asking me to go and see someone? I don't know what, but be alertness. Be alert in prayer. And for whom? Not only for myself. For all Christians. Which is we need to pray for the church, beloved. Let's stand to our feet. As I close in prayer, four, way, four ways God answers us. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says grow. Sometimes he says slow. And when all things are aligned in place, God says go. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for teaching us the importance of persistent prayer by emphasizing it through two parables. And today we understand the importance you give to persistent praying. Today I understood that persistent prayer is for my benefit because through praying persistently, I focus my attention to God and I also come to an understanding about myself I understand that greatest gift I could give anyone is attention because attention is time and attention is life and that's what I'm willing to give because you're a God who gave your life for me and I can only give my life, my time on behalf of another so I can build in Christ in him or her. Lord, may I be tested in my desires. May I be tested in my priorities. May I be tested in my maturity and my faith. Lord, give me grace to endure through this process so I am purified as silver and tested as gold so that the face of God will be seen in me and the character of Jesus will be built in me. Do give me a revelation to understand your answer to my prayer for you will always answer prayer for there is no unanswered prayer, Lord. Do give me wisdom and understanding what I should attend on when you say no, when you say grow, when you say slow, so that I could quickly come to alignment to hear you say go. Father, today teach me and give me a heart and a spirit like David so that Lord, that I will continually keep looking at you. My attention will be on you so that I will know there is no trap that can ensnare me. There will be no trap that can trip me because Lord, you are the one who guides every moment of my life. In everything that I am called to do, in everything I am called to move forward, Lord, you will show me the way. 
because you are the way maker you are the miracle worker and you are the promise keeper and your light shines in darkness lord father i want to thank you this evening that lord that in this season of learning about prayer that there is a pathway that is made for each one of us a pathway into our homes a pathway into our families a pathway into our life where jesus christ can come walking in just as he came to jerusalem the last time today even as we celebrate it around the world lord let this be a moment for each one of us that to understand that prayer makes pathways and we want to thank you for the pathways of prayer that has been taught to us in this church and through this church for many years that has built us to whom we are lord we thank you that prayer makes the pathway for god to go forward and do what god has done for us lord it is not only a pathway that prayer makes to go forward but there is a pathway for god to work inside of me that also comes through when i pray persistently do lord lord make your pathways clear inside of me so that my desires come fully to you because your word says lord god you grant the desire of everyone because that's your promise lord but the key to that is lord giving my attention to you lord lord let us be people who will not be give our time and attention to the news of the world but give our time and attention to you and your word because that it'll instruct us like a compass where we want to go father so today lord we want to make a covenant with you and say lord take my life and let it be consecrated lord to thee take my moments and my days and let them flow in ceaseless place take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love take my feet and let them be swift and beauty full for thee take my voice and let me sing always only for my king take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee take my silver and my gold not a might would i withhold take my intellect and use every power as you choose here i am all of me take my life it's all for thee if that's your prayer if that's your prayer i would request you to keep distance but come up to the altar as an affirmation to the lord we will sing that song once and then i'll ask brother lalit to come and take through the altar as the lord leads so if you are affirming say lord this is what i want this is what i want that's your choice come up to the altar and stand at the altar may the lord take you to that promised land that he has for you beloved you may be very successful in life or partly successful in life it does not matter but what god has for you in the future is greater than what he has done for you in the past that's god's promise and that's what god has been speaking to us this last few days we heard it about even in the bible study last night there is a portion for everyone step in and take it take my life and let it be Do come forward and stand keep a distance but do stand